Hello, and welcome to this, the third of Renew's Green, Six Green Rebuild Toolkit Seminars. Tonight's webinar is Materials and Construction for Bushfire and Climate Resilience. We acknowledge the traditional owners of country throughout Australia and recognize their continuing connection to land, waters, and culture. We pay our respects to their elders past, present, and emerging. Sovereignty was never ceded. Always was, always will be Aboriginal land. We encourage you to share in the chat the Aboriginal land from which you are joining us tonight. Also, we acknowledge that it is possible something you hear may be emotionally challenging for you. We encourage you to reach out for support if this occurs. One resource is Beyond Blue. They are available 24 seven and their number is 1-300-22-46-46. That's 1-300-22-46-46. And now to some housekeeping. Please note that the webinar is being recorded. There are a couple of webinar functions we encourage you to use tonight. The chat function is on the bottom left-hand side of your screen. Simply click on the icon to use the chat. It would be great if you haven't already done so that you chat, test the chat function by sharing with others where you are reaching us from tonight. Next, the Q&A function is on the bottom right-hand side of your screen. Similarly, click on the icon to open the window, type in your question and press enter. You can also upvote questions by pressing the thumbs up icons. The Green Rebuild Toolkit is a project from Renew, a member-based nonprofit organization who have provided Australians with expert independent advice on sustainability since 1980. Renew also publishes two leading sustainability magazines, Renew and Sanctuary. Through this work, Renew has worked directly with designers, architects, and sustainability experts for over 40 years. The devastating bushfires of 2019, 2020 prompted Renew to share some of the expert resources that have been collected along the way. And so the Green Rebuild Toolkit project began. It is intended as a platform to share Renew's expertise, to amplify other projects and people doing good work in this space and share the stories of those rebuilding. The toolkit can be found online. It is divided into eight sections that walk readers through the process of rebuilding. You can read it chapter by chapter or jump to sections that interest you. Throughout it, you will find expert feature stories buyer's guides, and case studies. There are also many links to external resources, which you can find in the blue boxes in the margins. Importantly, the toolkit is designed to grow and evolve. If you know of a project that you think should be included, or you would like to share your own rebuild story, please follow the links on the website. And now to tonight's program. We have three speakers tonight. They will each speak for seven to 10 minutes, after which we will have a Q&A. Responding to questions you have posed in the Q&A function on your screen. I'll now introduce myself and then our three panelists for the evening. I live in far Eastern Victoria in Malakuta, a remote coastal community profoundly impacted by the 2019-20 bushfires. I've volunteered for years in efforts to grow community and regional resilience. I'm coordinator of the Malakuta Sustainable Energy Group, a member of the Friends of Malakuta, and I present two weekly programs on 3MGB Wilderness Radio, our little volunteer community radio station. The first is from Little Things, where I celebrate the little things that happen in our community and in the outside world. The second is Healthy Conversations, where I chat with the local doctor. I also run Carbathon Consulting, a small practice where my focus is nurturing resilience, helping individuals, organizations, and communities create sustaining futures. I particularly like helping others develop their skills for living responsibly and responsively. Remarkably, since my husband and I moved to Malakuta 11 years ago from North Warrandyte in the bushy northeast of Melbourne, our daughter, her husband and two youngsters, and our son have also moved here. 
we, are, we were all here on New Year's Eve 2019. We chose to defend our daughter's property and to prepare the other two as best we could and leave them to whatever occurred. The, the fires came very, very close to both of our homes, but in no small part due to neighbors and emergency services, our properties were not lost and the defense of our daughter's home was also successful. 121 other families in town were not so fortunate. Our town has established a community-led recovery association and COVID willing, our plans for recovery are continuing to emerge. And now to our speakers. Our first speaker is Dick Clark. Dick is principal of EnviroTecture and an accredited building designer with 40 years experience focusing exclusively on ecologically sustainable and culturally appropriate buildings and has received many design awards. He is Director of Sustainability and past president of the New South Wales chapter of BDAA. He is a past president and board member of the Association of Building Sustainability Assessors. He has designed hundreds of projects with sustainability as a major focus, considering an ever-changing understanding of what sustainability is covering a wide variety of projects. Dick has contributed to the Your Home series and edited How to Rethink Building Materials. Dick will provide an overview of different materials in terms of bushfire resilience, their affordability and accessibility. Next, we will hear from Tom Kadai. Tom is a practicing architect with 20 years experience in architecture and design. He has worked in several small and medium-sized architecture firms in Melbourne and Canberra and across a variety of architectural types and scales. He is currently running a small practice working between Canberra and New South Wales South Coast with a focus on coastal architecture and climate resilient buildings. Tom will provide a case study of building with bushfire resistant materials. Our final speaker for the evening will be Rick Coleman. Rick grew up at Glen Allidale on a farm, went to the local primary and high school before heading to uni and coming back to the farm in 1995. Rick has always been interested in appropriate technology and renewables. In 2014, Rick's home was burnt out in the Mount Ray bushfire where he lost his house, sheds, yards, wool shed, stock, and 30 kilometers of fencing. Rick is still rebuilding, trying to find good and cost-effective solutions rather than conventional or merely code compliant ones. Rick will provide a case study of building his own home and focusing on materials and climate sensitive design. Before Dick begins, I'll just remind you that all three presentations will run first and then we will have a Q&A discussion with the panel members. If you want your question to be included, please make sure you put it into the Q&A, not the chat. And now to our first speaker. Over to you, Dick. Thank you very much, Tricia. Um, I will fire up the old uh, PowerPoint and get it going and we'll, um... so just using, uh, I guess this is a little bit of a, a case study too. I hope um, I don't uh, clash too much with what Tom's going to present, um, but using uh, the rebuild of the um, property that was, that I, shown last at last evening's webinar and just running through some of the material selections that we have made this time around and and how that relates to the bell rating and and whether we're considering the bell rating to be sufficient etc so there are a number of structures that we're building or rebuilding here um, they were all burnt down in the gospers mountain fire um, which ironically the owners of this property were at our were Christmas party on the evening of that it burnt down during that long running and devastating fire and we were watching it on fires near me the RFS app and uh, just kind of shaking your heads going well it either survived or it didn't um, it didn't 
So it's being replaced. The shed was replaced straight away, like for like um, almost, but the cottage uh, was basically redesigned and extended a little bit from the original. And we also wanted to do an analysis of how to re reduce risk um, ongoing. So the south side is now classified as BAL 29. The original building was built to the previous standard of 2004, which only had three levels in it. And uh, it was classified the, the middling level for that. And uh, this time around it's BAL 29 and we think that's inadequately low. So we're rebuilding it to a mix of BAL 40 and flame zone. So there's no exposed timber at all. Um, decks are FC boards. Uh, or sheets, we're still um, working through some options there on steel framing and uh, that's steel framing to, to ground as well. Colourbond cladding again uh, with a vented cavity uh, to give us the uh, breathability and condensation control that we want. Colourbond roofing on a conventional timber frame, not EPS um, SIPs, which is what the last building was built of and I've, I've got something to say about SIPs a bit later on. And that's also on a vented cavity fix system. And if you're not aware of what those systems are and what's coming in the upgrade of the uh, National Construction Code in May of next year, uh, I suggest you, you get across that because uh, there are some real issues there that a lot of the industry is still not across. Glazing is all to bowel 40 and we in, have increased our firefighting reserve from 10,000 to 20,000 litres. And it's now all in, in concrete and steel tanks. And hopefully there'll be some water in the dam. That was empty last year because of the long dry period. And we will be installing a sprinkler system and, and a remotely operated pump. So the firefighting reserve is close at hand to the approach to the, to the property so that the uh, fireys can pull straight up to that tank, hook up the stores fittings and, uh, and stay uh, away from the hazard. So they don't have to go around to the approach, which would be from the north, northwest to the right of this image. The shed was immediately re replaced and that's got a PV system on, on top to power the property. And then the new house uh, is partly on the old slab plus an extended raised floor, which is now completely sealed to the subfloor and um, fire rated. So in the new house, we've got uh, a roof that is being built to color, uh, with Calibon to Bell 29, which is effectively the same as about 40 in, in reality, but it's also been cavity fixed, as I mentioned, to the uh, National Construction Code 2022 or current best practice for condensation and, and vapour control. And the main water supply is in the same location that the old one was, but instead of using poly tanks, because <laughs> they melted and burned away, even though they had 60,000 litres of water in them, um, this time around we are using and have already installed colour bomb tanks with a liner and, uh, and there is no vegetation around those to make sure that the, the tanks themselves uh, are not exposed to direct flame. So the new cottage, the, uh, the grey box around there shows the existing slab. And uh, that's pretty much just exactly as everything was before. There's an extension of that living area to the right with the timber floor, but an enclosed subfloor all built to BAL 29, effectively BAL 40, um, with a, a drop down awning. And to the south, there's an extension with a new bathroom that used to be external is now made internal. And decks. So the decks are steel framed, as I mentioned, um, and uh, not going to, so there's no exposed timber in this building anymore um, of any kind. The old one had some iron bark and um, black butt exposed, black butt decking, and that was a point of ignition. So that's what the slab uh, looked like after it was cleaned up and the sections of the slab that had burned, basically um, popped off exposing the Rio, et cetera. We got that checked out, the structure, it was all okay. So that could be uh, patched with a special patching compound and then that slab reused. And then the new structure goes on top with the extended floor beyond. However, important point, compliance does not equal adequacy. Um, compliance just means you can't get sent to jail. <laughs> 
for doing the wrong thing. So the National Construction Code in 2022 changes things. Will it change things enough? Well, we'll wait and see. There's still a bit of uh, it's, the drafts out for discussion, but there's still more to deal with. So the, the important thing here, and this is uh, that diagram there so that shows a typical wall section. This is more about condensation control and vapour control than the actual fire the bushfire resistance, which is really about the external materials and the lack of conductivity into the frame itself. So the new kind of rule around these things is to wrap right for moisture and vapour and for barrel rating. So whatever wall wrap you use, uh, depending on whether it's airtight or just vapour tight, it also has to meet the relevant barrel rating, um, which that one obviously does. The roof likewise, you can see the double battening there. There's a roof batten running across the roof in the usual way to screw the roofing down, but they are fixed to each rafter and truss with a longitudinal batten that runs up the rafter that allows condensation to form under the metal roof and run down on top of that waterproof but vapour permeable membrane into the gutter. And that is also bell rated. Now the, the old building um, used a uh, first generation Ritec, as the brand then was, SIP, structural insulated panel, that had an EPS core. And we, we suspect that it was a likely cause of ignition, even though it was supposedly vapor, uh, um, ember proofed. This particular company have, um, has been split up and, and the product's been renamed. Uh, now it's called ARC panel, ARC panel. And they have a PIR foam, which is polyisocyanurate which does not burn, it'll char, but it does not combust. And that is a very different ball game. Now we didn't end up using it this time, but we could have. So that is quite a good product to use, but never use EPS. EPS has got whiskers on it and we're trying to get it removed from the industry and from our community use entirely. So we're on a bit of a war path on that one. Um, big gutters, catch what you can, get it into the, uh, into the tanks. FC sheet or uh, um, um, board decking, corrugated cladding, that's all fine. It's just the detail of how that's then fixed and the ember proofing, which is of critical importance. So the ember proofing can't un uh, understate the importance of it because that's how 90% of buildings burn down. It is through ember penetration into combustible material. We have to keep the embers out. Double glazing to bell 40, um, even though it's only a bell 29 site, and a perimeter sprinkler system will be installed as well. And this will be automated remotely. So even though it's only bell 29, we're saying, look, let's go above and beyond. This has got to be a pretty autonomous kind of building. So no exposed timber uh, and the sprinkler system, as I mentioned, with lots of rainwater capacity to back it up. Now, final, just in closing, the current AS3959-2018 in its flame zone detail basically prescribes a condensation time bomb. And this has been picked up by a number of people who have workshopped a solution. And that solution was run through Ignis Solutions who are fire engineers who um, analyzed it. And a year ago, exactly, it was sent to the New South Wales RFS uh, for kind of type approval. And just this uh, last week, we got a response from them to say, yes, we're happy with that. So this is going to reflect the changes in the 2022 building code or beyond. So this is equal to world's best practice adapted to Australian bushfire conditions. Um, this detail we will be making available through Renew. So uh, you, you, you need to get it out there with whoever your design professionals or builders are to make sure that this, if you're in flame zone, uh, that this is incorporated. And of course, you can follow through it uh, with BAL 40 as well, if you so choose. So there we go. That's the end of my presentation. And uh, I look forward very much to seeing what Tom has to say now. Thanks very much for that, uh, Dick. I'll... Um do the same and try and get my PowerPoint up. Okay. Um, 
So I think uh, that was really good, um, actually, Dick, to see that as a case study. I think case studies are a good way to um, to discuss the the issues. So I'm going to talk about one of our projects uh, as a case study for building with bushfire resistant materials. Um, so this project uh, is a beach house uh, located at Rosedale on the, on the New South Wales South Coast. Um, it's a good one to discuss as a, a case study because firstly it was built to uh, bow flame zone uh, and on a modest budget. Um, secondly, we think it retained the, the elements we try to bring to good architecture despite the bushfire construction uh, constraints. Uh, and most importantly, uh, for its use as a case study, uh, it was unfortunately um, put to the test uh, in the 2019, uh, 2020 New Year's Eve bushfires. Uh, so I'll talk very briefly about the design and then I'll run through the materials uh, and construction using some images. Uh, and then at the end, if we have time, I'll show a few uh, of the images of the house taken the morning after the fires, which are devastating. Um, I'll just, uh, just briefly show the, um, uh, some very early sketches uh, and also this image of the finished house uh, to highlight that from the outset, we, we imagined a relatively uh, enclosed approach. So um, partly due to our architect architectural style, um, but also this greatly helps when detailing for the bushfire construction requirements for flame zone. Um, However, once you um, go through the front door, it opens up. All the glazing is directed at taking in the views to the ocean. Um, and I wanted to show this uh, just to explain that while, while glass is one of those materials that is the easiest to reduce uh, in response to the flame zone construction requirements, we think it's important that these elements uh, that bring that architectural delight aren't lost along the way while focusing on designing for the bushfire threat. Um, and that's very important, we feel. Um, <clears throat> this was our site, typical flame zone site. The site after clearing, um, note the neighboring house, which is a brick veneer house uh, with a tiled roof. Um, and this, the images at the very end show that after the fires. Um, so, we just used a steel um, piers and steel floor framing system. Uh, due to the budget constraints, we, um, we elected to, to use one of the off the shelf systems. There are plenty of them out there. Um, this one was a Spantec system using their easy piers, but there's also uni piers and, and other uh, off the shelf framing systems that are very effective and very affordable. On top of that uh, is timber frame construction. Um, so the fire resistance level required for walls, even in flame zone, is actually relatively low compared to other structural fireproofing. Um, and that's because the structure isn't expected uh, to need to withstand the fire for very long. So while a bushfire can be quite intense, uh, it's only there for a matter of minutes before the fire front passes. Um, and so just also reinforcing what Dick said, that the most important aspect of resisting bushfire with, with walls and, and the building envelope uh, tends to come from the tight tolerances and sealing up of the building skin that's required under the standards for flame zone. So the fire resistance level required is a 30 minute fire resistance level. And there are wall systems out there from most of the manufacturers like CSR and James Hardy, um, that have been tested to prove they achieve this uh, using lightweight construction that are, that are readily available. Um, looking at the roof, it's the same, uh, 
same thing, a timber framed um, construction. Uh, this house used one of the uh, deemed to satisfy uh, systems uh, or solutions at the end of the, the Australian standard. Um, that does have a few issues, but basically it, it just requires lining over the top of your timber frame, framing with, uh, with plywood and then putting your, uh, your metal roof sheeting goes over that. Uh, wrapping it up. Um, so we used a uh, James Hardy uh, boundary wall system um, to give us our 30 minute fire resistance level, um, but we substituted out the exterior fibre cement cladding for a CSR fibre cement cladding. So they're a little bit flexible um, as far as the systems go, so long as you, you, you stick to the same thickness as in the tested system. Um, and this image shows the walls um, as they're getting lined. You can see that's the James Hardy, uh, Hardy fire insulation, which is required as part of that system. We have to thicken out the walls to 140 mil studs to get enough insulation in there for the thermal requirements. And for the bushfire shutters, we used roller shutters. Uh, and in these images, you can uh, you see how we uh, we, over the deck area, recess them up into the suffete to, to at least try and conceal a little bit of the, um, the shutters when they were put away. Uh, for the remaining shutters, we, um, uh, because they were smaller on smaller windows, they've got smaller head boxes and we accepted the, just the look of the head box on the outside of the building, but we designed it in. Um, and you can see that effect of, of recessing the roller shutter head boxes over the deck. Um, when the shutters are up, uh, and also um, as as uh, Dick had discussed before with the deck, it's all uh, fibre cement boards um, and stainless steel for the railings, and no ex exposed timber, obviously, for flame zone. Um, so that's the house. Uh, I think I've got a little bit of time to just uh, show a few of these images. So the fires came through um, on New Year's Eve uh, morning uh, down at Rosedale and uh, yeah it was the situation where we didn't know what to what to expect but we went down the next morning and um, were able to take some photos and so while it's uh, while it's devastating it, it, it was good that the house held up, but that, that just seeing that what happened to the town is obviously devastating. Um, uh, but uh, the survival of the house, I'd put largely down to uh, probably uh, out of anything of, of the sealing up that was done as, as part of the requirements. Uh, more importantly than any of the materials, it all works together, but sealing them up is certainly the most important. Although I'll end on a, an image of, of how it looked before and it's, it's getting back there too. Um, so that's me, I'll pass over to Rick now. Good evening all. Um, I won't subject you to my ugly mug for too long. Um, I'll switch over to a PowerPoint slide as well. I'm in Gunai Kurnai country. Uh, so just give me two seconds. There we go. Um, hopefully you've got the, no, hit that. Hopefully you can see what's going on now. We, first thing I'll say is um, having been through a fire, I'm not going to say I know how you feel because everyone is impacted very differently. It's very, even within the same family, it's a very different experience. And for those that have been through the Black Summer, it's an incredibly cruel event and even more cruel that COVID's taken the focus and support away from you folk. My main work is as a beef farmer. I work for Gellin a couple of days a week. Um, so it's just a fairly full on experience trying to recover. First confession is that we didn't plan on building a greenhouse much of what, or sustainable house, much of what we did sort of just made sense at the time. 
we didn't have the money to pay somebody to build a house that ticked all the boxes that we thought were important. So we decided to build it ourselves. Um, we looked at the idea of using soil to build, but we're in an area where the clay all dissolves in water. We thought a house that dissolved in the rain was probably not a clever idea. We had lots of stone on the place, so that's what we opted to build out of. The priorities that we were looking for were that obviously the house couldn't burn again. It had to be comfortable. It had to be practical. It had to be low maintenance and it had to be low energy. One of the things about stonework is that because it's slow, it gives you time to think and to clarify your ideas and to do some research. It's really important to decide what your priorities are and where and how far you're prepared to make compromises. Um, my wife suffers from asthma. So for us, a healthy home included trying to minimize volatile organic compounds as much as possible, VOCs. And that just adds to the challenge. Going back to the earlier comment about compliance not being necessarily being acceptable, when you look at conventional building technologies, a lot of it seems to be stuck in the 1950s. So it pays to look at how people in extreme climates such as Europe and North America cope, and then you can scale back from where they are. We found that knowledge about VOCs and their impact on health within the building industry is almost non-existent. And the fact that there are two different international standards just confuses things. Europe has a different definition to the USA. We also noticed that a lot of the energy saving technology focuses on keeping you warm in winter. In Australia, we need to think hard about keeping cool in summer. It's easier to heat a house than to cool it. With non-conventional materials, we found not only was it hard to find information, having learned about the product and think things like magnesium oxide board, Vortec compressed draw panels, airtight construction technologies, mega anchors that I'll touch on in a minute, um, fire crunch. Having learned about them, it's often hard to source them and it's even harder to find reliable companies to deal with. And just don't ask us about Zenit Windows, two and a half years to have our water bill filled. There's then also the big issue of how do you interface them with conventional materials? So going to our solution, as I said, we, we selected stone for downstairs. It's a hardwood timber frame upstairs with a fibre cement planking. Sorry, wrong screen. When we were choosing materials, first criteria was would they burn? Did they contain plastics or glues? Were they high maintenance? Did you need to be a skilled artisan to use them? And could we physically manage them? Fortunately, my wife said that she was happy for a rustic house because I said, I can do rustic, I can't do artisan. Were they outrageously expensive compared to other products? How available are they? Can we get them locally or do we have to transport them? And what's the product's reputation? And the priorities for the home were, were healthy environment. And I mentioned VOCs. The comment was made about condensation time bomb. Condensation building up between the outer skin of the home and the inner skin can lead to a buildup of mold and the molds can get, give off spores, which lead to asthma and all sorts of issues. So condensation was a big issue and we're trying to avoid the deliberate use of poison such as termite chemicals. So we've gone for a physical termite barrier instead of the poison. 
for self-defending against fire, we've got nothing flammable below the tops of the windows. We figure by the time we've got a solid deck that if we've got flames above window height, we're in so much trouble that it's not funny. All openings are sealed or covered with stainless steel mesh. We found that aluminium mesh burns, even the heavy stuff. We do have external timber, but it's very big and chunky, which gives it a very high fire rating. And we're setting things up so that um, the house will have a slow combustion stove, but the wood will be in a wheelbarrow on the veranda so it can be just wheeled away quickly so we can get fuel loads away from the house. We've aimed for durable products. You can see on the fascia board that we've painted that it's the paint job has gone to, to trash. We're now minimizing external paints. The, the paint that went to trash is a, an um, eco paint and basically it's gone. So we're going to cover that external timber with zinc loom flashing, which won't ever need painting um, instead of using a paint. We've also tried to design the house so that we can manage when we're less mobile. The veranda deck will have a ramp access, which will also allow us to wheel our shopping up and our firewood up. We've built in wide doors. You can see the double doors to the north um, and it's been set up so that we can live downstairs. Above all else, it has to be affordable and it has to be practical. So one technology that we used, if I can get the PowerPoint to bridge, move on is the steel subfloor for the, the veranda and the veranda deck. That's based on a technology called mega anchors and they comprise of a stirrup that sits on the ground. You drive three lengths of pipe down into the ground as far as they'll go. In this case, about 1100 mil for each of the three pylons. And they go out in different directions as they go out giving a very strong bearing strength. They've been used for cyclone proof housing in New Caledonia. Round pipe fits inside the stirrup. There's a bracket that then holds up the top hat bearer. We've got channel bolted to the stone wall for the other end of the floor joists, steel floor joists and square steel veranda posts to, to finish the ensemble off. We haven't got the actual decking yet. That'll be um, the fire crunch sheet decking product so that we don't have any gaps for flames to come up between the, um, the decking planks. And the plan is to also put a concrete skirt under the veranda deck so that there'll be nothing growing to be flammable underneath the veranda. We opted for aluminium windows because we were looking for low maintenance, but we put, um, we have thermal break in them, which should be the next thing. Windows are a massive, massive topic. They're one of your biggest expenses. And there's something that you spend so much time agonizing over. It's, it's not funny. Mention was made about the detail in having to seal. So we opted for aluminium thermal broken frames. You can see we've used the, the blue wrap to wrap the house. And then we've used the black tape to seal to the window. And then we've used an aluminium flashing tape to seal yet again. The New Zealand stand, um, Window Association has a much better specification on how to do the flashing at the tops of windows than the Australian Window Association, AWA, Australian Window Association. So we ended up following that. As owner builders, we wanted to try and do it once and do it right. We've also used the aluminium flashing tape to seal any gaps under the roof as well. So the big focus was to try and make it affordable, make it practical and make it fireproof. 
So I think I could talk for hours and hours and hours, but I've only got 10 minutes, which is now up. So I'll hand back to our host. Rick, did you want to show the 360 picture? Thank you for reminding me. I'd forgotten that bit. <laughs> oh. So for those who are interested and if you've got the bandwidth to cope, um, a couple of months ago, we ended up with a 360 degree camera on site. So I'll hopefully not make you too dizzy, but you can see the framing is in place there for an openable skylight, a billet, which is bushfire rated in the upstairs so that we can vent hot air out. So we've got a double sky atrium, double doors moving around to, so that's, so there our windows to the north and we set the eave up on the north at 1200, which gives us good sun penetration in winter for warmth in winter, but we don't get sun on the windows at all in summer or at least during the middle of the day. Northwest corner is our study area. Um, so again, same windows on the, the northern side of it. The western windows are much, much smaller to minimize the hot sun coming in. They're double glazed and they're also low E glass to minimize heat penetration. Mucky farmer's shower in the corner, mucky farmer's toilet, enormous pantry and Sorry, I'll get us up straight a bit. Kitchen, dining, and where the camera is sitting in the, the living area. The ladder goes to upstairs, which I then grab that one. We should magically go upstairs, master bedroom. No, spare bedroom, sorry. That's the atrium space. Master bedroom, you can see we're starting to insulate the walls. Upstairs bathroom and the other bedroom. You can see the reveals for the windows are extra thick because we're going to have a secondary wall on the inside with so a space between the insulation and the secondary window to allow the wiring and plumbing to run so we don't compromise any of our insulation with um, the wiring and the plumbing. One comment on European technology is that there are a couple of things that it doesn't cope with well. One is the extra high levels of ultraviolet that Australia has compared with Europe. The other is cockatoos. Now that we've got the veranda framing going up, the cockatoos reckon that that blue wrap is just the most entertaining thing ever. So we're going to have to put flashing over it until we're ready to put the, the cladding on. If I go back downstairs. Particularly in the stonework, we used a pre-compressed foam tape around the windows and doors to seal the gap between the door frame and the window frame and the stonework, the cockatoos think that that is just Christmas. And they quite happily hook into that and reef that out. So we've actually then had to cork over the top of that. Um, so they're just a, a couple of traps. As I said, we're, we're aiming for practical, but sometimes we don't quite get there. I'll stop at that. Thank you, Rick. Now it's time for um, Rick, Dick, and Tom to uh, turn on their um, their video and audio, and we will go to questions. Thank you very much, all three of you, for wonderful case studies. Um, I'm I'm going to take the luxury of the first question, and that's for Rick, and and go to the. <laughs> Um, the, the years, right? The fire was 2014. 
correct? And it's we basically time. we basically took a had to take a year off just to try and rebuild enough fencing to try and get the farm going to start getting income going. We had some livestock that survived and we just had to be able to manage them. And effectively we've been working on it full time since. So the the need for rush, I mean that it's it must have been a balancing of of your, you know, the, you're wanting the right materials and so on and, and wanting a place, the place to be functional as well as having to run a farm. So I I can only imagine. <laughs> yeah, it's a challenge. It it understand. really is. Um some of the keys that we found were celebrate successes. Every time you have it, make a small hurdle, celebrate it. Um, we've got our off-grid power system. It's meant to be finished today. It'll be finished tomorrow. So we'll crack a bottle of bubbly tomorrow night. Um, when we got the frame up, there's a little cheap pub nearby. We're going to. Get, we went and had dinner at the at the pub. So celebrate successes. Mm look for as much information as you can. Um, we started building and then read everything we could. We should have done it the other way around. Mm, okay, <laughs> but you want to get something done. Thank you very much, Rick, for that. Now I'll go to questions um, from participants. Uh, let's go. Tom said, Tom, why didn't you have to clad all the way to the ground? Mm, very good question. Um, I saw there was another question there as well about... Uh, oh, yeah. Did um, you have to line under the steel floor joist to protect... The yeah, floor? that's right. It wouldn't, do we have to line? So, yeah, if you don't clad all the way to the ground, then you've effectively made yourself another wall to clad, um, another facade underneath. So um, the best way to do it, I think, is to line with fibre cement uh, underneath. Um, in that particular project we tried something that I'm not going to do again we did a hebel um, floor over the steel um, floor framing uh, and insulated with uh, in, an insulated and a timber floor over the top um, but that uh, yeah it didn't didn't work as well as we'd hoped so uh, we're working on one just down the road now um, and we're doing the same hebel floor, but we're actually insulating underneath and lining with fibre cement. And what I like about that is even the lining underneath, if that does get breached, then you've still got the hebel as a backup. Yeah. Mm. Right. That's good. So one or the other has to be done. It either has to be enclosed or you have to have gone, gone through that the, the final wall really yeah look if you're enclosing it all the way around that's quite a lot of extra wall to make as well so it's yeah one or the other you've got to just enclose it you know and, and right. that's that's the key is enclose 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 and seal up yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. i'm getting that message <laughs> don't leave anything open um okay chris asks what is the percent increase in cost to meet bell 40 or flame zone over a typical urban build, I uh, I assume it's like for for like energy rate. So is there is there a kind of a uh, some kind of common percentage of increase in cost? As you I I, I did have a, a bit of a, a guess uh, just based on the for flame zone based on uh, that that one house uh, that it's. Upwards of 20%, yeah. Okay. Dick? Yeah, I, it's actually a little bit less than it was five years ago. So that's probably some good news. The, the number mm. of fire shutters on the market has introduced a lot more competition and the, the cost of shutters has come down. I mean, whew, going back, when, the, when the, the new standard first came out, it was just, uh, it, it killed a number of projects off completely where clients just said, well, sorry, I just can't, I can't afford that now. And they walked away. That's no longer the case. So that's that's good news. It is good news. Um, going on, it's it's uh, yeah, skylights with sky. What skylights are tested and compliant with Bell Twenty Nine or higher? Need to know as we can't seem to find any that you aren't paying through the nose. 
So skylights. Um, mm. I'll, I'll start by saying that you will pay through the nose. Um, but, <laughs> but, but, but Velix seemed to be pretty good. I'll hand over. Okay. Uh, look, my, my response is if, if, if you're in an open paddock scenario, you, you might think uh, want to use skylights for some reason or other. But, but if you're in a, a site like uh, the one I showed or certainly the one that, that Tom showed, I wouldn't be going anywhere near skylights of any kind. They're just too risky. And that's the reason the, the standard is so stringent on them. Um, and, and as I've often said over the years, when you think about a skylight, what is it you're trying to achieve? Are you trying to achieve just a level of utilitarian light so that you don't have to turn a light in a, a dark hallway somewhere? Um, or are you uh, definitely looking for natural light or need to see the sky or watch the moon at night or something? You know, so depending on what your purpose is, if it's just for utilitarian light, then the virtual skylights, especially in a bushfire scenario, are a much better option. Those are the skylights that use um, a cool white daylight LED panel uh, flush with the ceiling, or it can be downlights, but, but a panel kind of fools you into thinking it is actually a, um, an opal screen skylight with a, a direct drive DC coupled um, solar panel on the roof. And when the sun shine, the panel shines brightly. And when the cloud goes over, it dims and it just works exactly like a skylight. Mm -hmm. So for utilitarian light, they're fantastic and they have zero thermal impact. There's no heat gain or heat loss through them and no bushfire risk at all. So that would be my suggestion. Okay. I was looking for something like that some years ago. So were they fairly new on the market? Um, company, I don't remember, let's talk specific brand names we seem to have been tossing them around with some of this stuff on materials um the company that kind of pioneered them and, and and has become the hoover or the thermos of them um is on the new south wales central coast called ready light r-e-d-i-l-i-t-e -E. and uh and, and they're not the only one on the market now there are others but they've done a lot of work to develop into a very high standard and uh, so we're very happy to specify them right um tom Anything about skylights or not? Uh, look, no, I, I would. We're, I think uh, Dick was right. You know, it's, it's um, uh, having an unprotected sort of glass, a uh, bit, bit of glass on the building is is either very expensive or or, or risky. So um, uh, yeah. windows are okay because you can put a shutter over them, um, but um, we're still not at the point yet where you can really even get windows for flame zone uh, that are anywhere near affordable. So I think. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, Paul uh, asks Rick, can you describe your stone wall construction, please? So I made the decision that I wasn't a stone mason, so I wasn't going to do a laid stone construction. So our we set it up with slip form. So it's effectively two parallel planks, and you we stack the stonework along one face with the flat side against this, the, the form, backfilled with concrete and other stones, and then a nice pretty flat stone on the inside of the form. Did that for, for the length of our form, waited three hours for the concrete to go off, broke the form work off and that exposed the, the stone, the flat faces of the stone. And when I was on a good day, with minimal concrete between, and on a bad day with lots of concrete in between. Um, we figured it was a simple way of doing it where I didn't have to be a, do a, a five-year apprenticeship to, to, to get it right. All right, thank you. Um, Kevin asks, I have a mud brick house which survived a severe bushfire. How do mud bricks comply with, uh, with the bell system? Anyone? Yeah, well, um, after the Black Saturday fires in 2009, uh, I did a, a, a bit of a tour of some of the areas around King Lake and Steel Creek. And uh, I don't know, Kevin, I'm not sure if it was He's your place we had to look at or not, but- In uh, King Lake, you think King Lake. It's yeah, King Lake, yeah. And I think it was Steel Creek that we, we had a look at a, a garage that was built in out of mud brick. Um, that had not been ember proofed and, and everything burned except the mud brick. Um, the, the, the ute inside burned and its uh, cylinder head ran down the driveway in this beautiful sculptural 
dribble of aluminium. And, um, and yet the mud brick, you know, yeah, it, it survived really quite happily. So uh, it, it's a good thing. What we've found with earth materials is it, because they're not tested to the, um, to the standard AS 1530 part at 0.8.2, which is the, the kind of fiery crucible of hell test, um, some certifiers are uncertain about how to accept them. Most certifiers kind of take it on face value that the stuff's rock and it's not going to burn, but we have had to kind of make that point <laughs> the hard way on, on a couple of occasions. Yes, um, I lived in a mud brick in North Warrandyte and uh, it came very close to the 2009 fires, but uh, uh, wasn't, wasn't implicated. Uh, in Malakuta, a lot of our mud brick houses turned to dust. Really? Uh, yeah. Wow. So I, I wonder whether that's the, um, the heat of the fire, the intensity of the fire, mm. but... Uh, so I think there's a research project in what happened with maybe mm. yeah yeah that's so interesting it was I I had not expected that no um now uh, Rosemary asks what will the atrium in the last presenters be fenced what will the atrium so upstairs we have the atrium um we'll have a baluster on the open sides of that so two sides of the atrium will be walls for the bedrooms and the third side will have a, a balustrade so that people can't fall down there i'm thinking of put making the balustrading hinged so that we can actually use it put a block and tackle up for getting furniture upstairs Right. I have, a, I have a friend here who has a block and tackle for getting his firewood up onto the, they live on the top floor of their house. Uh, creative. Um, someone asks where you live in East Gippsland. Are you willing to share that? I'm out at Glen Allardale. It's um, 40 kilometres northwest of Bairnsdale, um, roughly halfway, halfway between Bairnsdale and Dargo and halfway between Sale and Dargo, if that means anything. Okay. Great, thanks. Uh, Dick, any plans, oh, David asks, any plans to update rethinking building materials? Uh, we, have, we have knocked on that door several times. The publisher and I would, would dearly love to, to uh, do a second edition. Um, it's devilishly hard to, to publish books like that in Australia without significant financial assistance. Um, watch this space where we revisit this on a six monthly kind of cycle. Trying. You're muted, Trish. Um, yes. Yeah, yeah, someone put my phone on silent. I apologize, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> it was on silent, but somehow. Okay. Uh, thank you, Dick. We'll wait for the, the update whenever it happens. Um, uh, where are we? Amazing, hearing your stories and case studies. Guess this one would be for Tom. What is the price of building a house like this? And would you consider it available for everybody to make fireproofing changes? And if yes, why aren't more people doing it? Um, I think, oh, well, it's, it's a couple of questions there. There's, making fireproofing changes to an existing house is, is one thing, um, but build, building to a higher a bell level uh, from when you're building from scratch is is, is another. So, um, to to build a house like that one, um, I I well, it depends what you consider to be accessible to most people. But you could do it for uh, quite a bit under five hundred thousand um, in flame zone. And um, I always say to people, look, you, you can always uh, build a house in flame zone, and you just make it smaller. Um, that's probably the, the best way to go and and that's part of what we do as designers is is try and um, uh, customize a, a house uh, for someone that's that's got what they need and not what they don't and if you can take 10 square meters out you save a lot of money uh, in in flame zones so um, yes I, I think small is the key um, if you have an existing large house that's old I I'd imagine it's quite a lot of work to um, to, to sort of re retrospectively re refit it. Um, 
there's probably certain things you could do. I have I haven't had experience with it. I'd have to say. Right. Tom, can I ask you on that last photo, or second last photo you showed of the house the morning after the fires, was that just the colour of the atmosphere that made the cement hill look as if it had been scorched or had it actually uh, yeah, been so scorched? It, oh, it had actually been scorched, uh, but the, uh, that left black marks. Um, the the orangey sort of colour was just in that eerie sort of next day yeah, right. morning glow, uh, which, which was the light. Um, in the photo, so um, I did see another question in the, in the list, which was about whether a house goes through a fire like that, whether you need to replace the cladding, uh, um, which is quite relevant. Um, and it, as it turns out, because um, that was a, a new house, it was less than two years old. The insurance company did agree to replace all the cladding. Um, the side that faced the neighbouring house that burnt down had a lot of damage just from the neighbouring house landing on it, uh, the bricks falling on it and things like that. Um, so they just agreed to, to do all of the cladding uh, under insurance. And interestingly, uh, the roof as well, it's colour bond, but the paint, like the, the surface had started to come away. So they did that as well, just because, you know, otherwise corrosion and everything down the coast. So you more or less, yeah, new, new roof and new cladding, um, or new roof sheeting and new roof cladding, but it's better than doing a whole house. Um, and, and the structure and the interior was completely intact. So um, we were able to go inside the very next morning and there wasn't even a smell of smoke. So it's retaining that sort of uh, just uh, integrity of the envelope mm. is the critical things. And that way, you know, all your, all your, all your possessions are, are retained and, and you don't have to do anything inside. But and, I think, you, yeah. sorry, go on. I think you would always have to replace some external elements. Yeah. Well, I was just going to say you, you you had no windows on that eastern side against the neighbour, as I recall. Uh, we actually had two windows. Oh, uh, really? Okay, sorry. I've and and this is uh, interestingly, it is a flame zone house on three elevations and the roof and floor. But the side that faced the neighbour, they allowed us to do that to about forty. So we didn't put shutters on those windows. And so they were just bow 40 windows and they survived, um, mm. but they were small windows. So I don't know if that was the reason, but uh, I think bow for, the requirements for bow 40 seem to hold up pretty well against, yeah, quite a bit of fire. Mm -hmm. Um, now, one for you, Dick. Uh, Robert asks, do you mean venting at the top of the cavity or the opening at the bottom of the cavity, which has a gap of about three mil? Ours are plastic, but our rating is valid. No. Okay, so the, the whole thing about cavity construction is that um, it, it allows the condensation to form. It assumes the condensation is going to form because it's a loss cause really to try and prevent it. So you, you've, you're allowed to form, but you can you corral it and stop it entering into the insulation and the interior uh, by means of the, the membrane behind it. But for that to dry out, the, the cavity has to be vented top and bottom. So air's got to be able to flow from the gutter to the ridge or from the base of the wall to the top of the wall. Um, and, and that's why you have to have these mesh systems rather than the uh, mineral wall. Um, but in Bell Low, uh, look, you know, Bell Low, it's all about embers and embers can melt plastic. So, uh, you know, I'd still be inclined to, uh, to go for metal. Right. Okay. The, um, I, can, I can see uh, themes here with uh, no plastic for water, for, <laughs> for anywhere. <laughs> Um, Lisa asks, uh, please advise on how and when a new build in Bell 29 zone, you would install a roof sprinkler system, I guess, and whether, whether you would see that as a... Um, well, it depends, I think, on the degree of autonomy you want the building to have. In, in the case I was showing there, that's a weekend or in a fairly remote site. Um, and it, it needs to have a, a high degree of autonomy. Um, it does have internet connection uh, to some extent, a sufficient extent to be able to activate things remotely. And um, 
and so the idea is that uh, by activating the sprinkler uh, as the, the fire approaches, um, you know, it, it'll do the job and, and keep running for some hours. Um, if it was bowel 29 in an urban environment, it's probably less critical because there's always going to be someone there, uh, if not the owners, then, you know, a neighbour or whatever. So it's, uh, but, you know, there's still an argument to say, well, if every building looked after itself, then the pressure on, on firefighting resources and personnel would be a lot less too. So, um, but in an urban environment, if you're going to put in sprinklers, you do have to have sufficient water and you can't rely on mains. Um, you do have to have sufficient water stored to, to be able to supply it and, and therefore you need room to do that. Um, and, you know, if the block of land is big enough, that might be okay. But if it's not, then that's going to be an issue too. So it's, there's no kind of one size fits all. Yeah. If, if I can chip into that. Um, yep. I'm actually a fiery in the local fire brigade. Um, I was out on the fire truck when our house burnt down. So the whole concept of houses and people being able to look after the houses themselves, I think is really, really important. When our house burnt down, there wasn't a fire truck within about 5K of it at the time. So we were all off in other parts, um, fighting the fire elsewhere. So um, I didn't mention that we've actually got a couple of them, but we're in a, the lowest bushfire rating, but we're building around that bell 29, uh, just going back to that comment of, is your current bell rating high enough? We didn't feel it was as well. So we've fitted um, Ember, Defem Ember Defender roof sprinklers um, while we had a cherry picker to do it. Mm. Great. Um, thanks, Rick. Um, Gary says, I noticed a picture sh that showed window flashing, which looked as though it had been installed head, then jam, then sill. It should be installed the reverse, or am I just misinterpreting the picture? I'm not sure who that is to. It might have been, I don't know, it might have been mine. <laughs> um, the, um, if, I can't remember if, if there's a picture of the, the window installed after the, the wall wrap went on, but basically the whole window and wall wrap are taped um, and the tape, the taping uh, becomes part of the flashing system. So it's not an open flashing with the, uh, the cavity fixing system that we use. It's a closed taped system. It's uh, effectively um, airtight. So, uh, yeah, it's probably misinterpreting the photo given that it's probably not a very high res transmission, but definitely flashed correctly. Okay, good. Um, Robert says, asks, are there any alternatives to shutters to protect windows or verandas, such as curtains on tracks made of material that doesn't burn? So shutters are playing a pretty big part here. Yeah, th there's lots of uh, different types of shutters now, which is probably uh, the, the answer to the question. I, I'm not aware of any curtain type ones, but um, uh, there, there are certainly some that, that fold in some very useful ways now that can create sun shading when they're folded up and, and things like that. Um, and okay. and it, it does seem to be the case that shutters are still the, the answer because uh, you, you, you can buy windows that are, are rated for flame zone, but I don't know anyone who's been able to afford them yet, uh, personally. <laughs> Is stainless steel fly screen across the entire window an option? Not, not for flame zone. Um, in New South Wales, there used to be a variation on AS3959 that allowed a non-combustible shutter to cover a BAL40 window, but it was a New South Wales anomaly and every other state basically said your fire shutter has got to be a, an FZ rated shutter protecting um, and, uh, an un, um, unrated window, uh, basically. Uh, that, yeah, that, that's true, um, Dick. That on, on that project that I showed, we used that uh, anomaly uh, where it was a, a BAL 40 window with a non-combustible uh, shutter that wasn't rated to necessarily to flame zone. Um, but we tried to use it on the next project and they said no, because now you can buy uh, F, yeah, FZ roller shutters, yeah. Hmm. Okay. Thanks. 
Thanks, uh, both of you. Uh, another question from Peter. Uh, I have a proposed construction with Hemp Creek internal walls with MGO board facing the external side with metal cladding externally. Is this design likely to be Bell flame zone compliant? Um, it's almost certainly going to do the job. Um, the, the only problem you will have is convincing a certifier that it does because that system has not been tested. Uh, the individual components have, and you could mount a case that if you assemble them the correct way with the correct fixings and connections that that um, that, that by definition or by logical analysis uh, does the job, but as a system, um, it, it hasn't been tested. So, and this is one of the problems we have that that the current standard and its interpretation is not allowing these kinds of innovations to to uh, you know to just kind of be introduced mm. without um, some level of difficulty. And what you were saying last last night was that the costs of having them tested for a particular rating can be uh, oh prohibitive, uh, like hundred thousand dollars for you know yeah it's it's that's um, not the sort of thing you could do on a project by project basis no right um okay can, can you read out the one from nigel <laughs> okay yes uh sorry can't agree about skylights says nigel natural light ventilation delight sustainable ordinary velics to bell 29 color bond flashing to bell 40. yeah i love a bit of controversy <laughs> thanks nigel <laughs> <laughs> Any more to say? <laughs> um, oh, look, everyone has a, a different take on that. Um, I, I suppose I, I'm a bit down on skylights from the point of view of the, the fact that they uh, transmit a lot, a lot of heat in and out unnecessarily. But you know, yeah, that, they each their own. Okay. Um, Alan says, surely mud brick fire behavior will vary according to type of earth used. So, what are the standards for dirt? <laughs> Um, I think that might have been a rhetorical question. Yeah, look, and, and look, sorry, I don't mean to hog this, Tom, jump in, but um, the, the problem is that every, every mud brick job that, that uses site um, or, or near site clays and, and soils, it, it is going to be different. And, and therefore, you don't know what the performance is going to be. So um, the, the Malakuta experience that you mentioned is, is disturbing yeah. from my point of view. Um, but very different to to what I saw at Steel Creek. So who knows? Yeah, it didn't fit my understanding of of history of mud brick. So mm. I, I I don't know enough about it to to say anymore. I'm I'm sure some people have been looking at that, but I um, yeah. Um, what is the star rating of the stone house? I suspect that that wouldn't have been a consideration, would it? <laughs> it, it actually hasn't been assessed. Um, we got the building permit in just before that all came in, so um, we were a bit lucky there. We're... The stone isn't insulated, but stays warm in winter and stays cool in summer. Upstairs, we're building, keeping it sealed and we're insulating it very thoroughly. So I'm, I'd be hoping for at least a seven, um, but as I say, not assessed. Yet, when it's all done, you might just choose to do that. <laughs> the proof will be whether it's comfortable. Ex yes. Um, Jay Walter says, hi guys, I'm building in flame zone without the possibility to establish a 10 meter asset protection zone. As far as I understand, my options are very limited. Are we mad? Um, I, yeah, well, I would say to that, your options if you can't do a asset protection zone are that your options are to build to flame zone but in my experience um the the houses that are in that situation are often in beautiful landscapes uh and i, I the last thing i'd want people to do is to not build in these places uh, i think it is possible so i would say you can probably just try and build to, to flame zone and if you're if you're struggling to afford it, just make it smaller. Hmm. Second that. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, and yes, this may be 
a time for reconsidering how big a house we need generally, not just for, for um, fi fire protection, but for, yeah, all manner of things. But that's another, mm. another issue, isn't it? Second that too. <laughs> <laughs> um, Michael asks, Tom, with the bare stone cladding, what do you, oh, did you use EPDM tape behind the express joints? And if so, did this survive? Uh, yeah, so I assume if that's the, we used the standard off the shelf bare stone system, um, which did include a, a black gasket uh, between the, the, the panels. So if that's what's being referred to, um, it did survive. It was a bit hard to tell how damaged it was because it's black. Uh, if you looked up close and you felt it, some areas felt rougher than others, but uh, it, it wasn't breached, I suppose you'd say. So like it survived, but it still got replaced along with the, uh, the, the panels. Um, we didn't replace the furring channels or anything, just the panels and the, the gasket. Um, so I guess that could be an argument for doing a, a different sort of fibre cement cladding that doesn't have express joints, but it, it's still, it's still held. And I, I think that's, that's the in intention of the, the Australian standard is to maintain the sort of integrity of the, the structure, um, but not to have zero damage to the outside uh, because there aren't too many materials that could go through a fire and still look exactly the same. Right. That, that's an important point, that the Australian standard is not talking about your building coming through unscathed. Yeah. It's talking about your building surviving. And there's a distinction between those two things. Yeah. And I mean, another point is that um, all the plumbing on that house at Rosedale had to be replaced as well. All the PVC just melted away. Mm. Um, so, yeah, there will always be things, yeah, not to mention the, uh, the pressure sewer system um, and the hot water system, all, all that stuff on the outside went, yeah. So th there's always going to be lots to do after a fire mm. like that. Right, that's a good point to make about the, the flame zones. It doesn't mean that nothing, nothing changes. Mm. Mm. Um, some language that uh, are you using uh, HRV or ERV with such a tight building envelope? What do those words mean? Or acronyms? HRV. Okay, ERV. HRV is a heat recovery ventilation system. ERV is an energy recovery ventilation system. They're, they're kind of similar thing. Um, and that's a really good point because as we make buildings more airtight, and this is, this is where passive house is going. Uh, or has gone already, that um, as you make the building more airtight, even though the, the, the building fabric within the wall can breathe, the air within the building can't because it's fundamentally a, a tight building. And, uh, and so then you have to manage the ventilation system. Um, and there are a couple of different ways of doing that. Um, I don't know if you can see in the background of my office here, but right up about there is a little box on the wall little white thing oh, yeah. um, that is one half of a push me pull you um, HRV system that uh, has a ceramic heat bank inside it and, and yeah they're, so that's a small scale decentralized system um, you can get centralized systems etc and uh, the scale of the building is going to determine which one's most appropriate so for for little buildings the little decentralized systems are quite affordable less than four thousand dollars um, buys you uh, those units. Centralized system, which is going to do a much bigger kind of family size home or bigger, um, you need to budget about 15. Um, but yeah, it's a good point. You, you can manage without it, but you have to be very active about um, opening windows and doors at the appropriate times so you don't lose all your heat um, in winter or let a horrible uh, um, heat in in summer but the beauty of the HRVs is that you can filter them and so you're getting your fresh air you're not getting heat or cold because it's a heat recovery heat exchanger and you can filter it and, and the good centralized systems can filter down to PM 2.5 which takes out about 94 I think percent of the smoke particulates it doesn't take out 100 percent but it gets pretty close. Great, thank you. Uh, Tom, there's a question. What are the insurance costs? And I'm assuming that would be the insurance costs for a building like the flame zone one we're talking about. Uh, uh, yeah, I think it, it, that, that would be what, what are the insurance costs 
uh, to insure the house once it's built? I, I don't know, uh, other than to say that the, the client for that house didn't uh, have any complaints um, and it was insured and the insurers were great. They just came through and paid straight away. So mm. uh, the only struggle we had is because it was a relatively new house, we wanted to get the builder who recently finished it to do the repairs. And that mm. took a little bit longer to, to get quotes from our own builder and things like that. But um, I'm, not, I, you know, I'm not sure which way it's going to go now as we start to try and ensure all these rebuilds that are happening. Um, they're all built to the, the, the standards. Um, uh, but I, I honestly don't know because I, I haven't had to pay it. <laughs> yeah. The other thing we, we don't know is statistically whether the standards are actually working. I mean, we know they do something. Do they do enough? Do they do too much? We just don't know. Um, the CFA in Victoria has started collecting some data and, and I think it needs to be made national so that it's statistically meaningful. And we've got, I think we've got enough fire history around the country now to, to have many thousands of examples of, of um, compliant buildings to, and just see how did they go? Um, it's a bit of a research, it was a PhD in there for someone. Mm. Mm. It's also a highly variable topic, um, just with our own bushfire, what survived and what didn't survive was almost a matter of chance. We had um, a $1,500 electric start fire pump down by a dam that did a really good job of protecting the $50 jerry plastic jerry can of petrol that was about 10 feet away. The fire pump burnt, but the jerry can didn't. <laughs> so there's so much variability in just what survives and what doesn't that it's multiple PhDs. <laughs> yeah. And something perhaps a bit, bit easier. Uh, there are a couple of questions about sprinkler systems, um, the types of sprinkler systems and brands and, and so on. So any, any thoughts? Uh, look, a rough budget for like for, for the little cottage we're looking at there about 15,000. Okay. okay. Um, quick one, what's the fire resistance of concrete? <laughs> It'd be pretty good. Uh, <laughs> um, all, all masonry, uh, well, unless you consider mud bricks and, and those sorts of things, but, uh, you know, all, all the masonry seems to perform pretty well. Um, it, it's, it's more going to be about, you know, do you have any gaps between your concrete and your, the rest of your structure? Mm. Yeah, the, the, um, the ability of concrete to resist combustion, of course, is, you know, that's a no-brainer, but the ability of reinforced concrete to hold together between the masonry element and the steel reinforcing element is, is where things tend to come apart. So um, the slab up at Laguna that I showed, the Rio had obviously got so hot with this um, you know, lump of fire burning on top of the, the concrete that it had expanded and burst off the top 25 millimetres of concrete. Um, didn't do any other damage and we were able to patch that and get it back down again. And and, and a, um, I've also seen down at Steel Creek again, or was it King Lake, um, a concrete tank that was empty uh, and the fire basically shattered the concrete and all that was left was the skeleton of the steel reinforcing inside. So it's not, it, it's not going to always survive everything you throw at it, but it's definitely you know, one of the best materials you could really build anything out of to, to give you um, a frontline fire resistance. Just another example, um, we had a concrete tank up beside our two-storey wooden wool shed. When the wooden wool shed burnt, the heat was such that we ended up with a lot of cracks in the, in the concrete tank. Um, and another concrete tank beside another shed, a lot of the concrete exploded off it. Um, both tanks, in theory, could be repaired. Though the one by the wool shed's pretty stuffed. Mm. Yeah. Um, there's one uh, question for you, Dick. You mentioned you did not think that the assessment for the site you discussed at Bell 29 was appropriate. Do you think there are issues in regards to how the standards work? Um, uh, yeah, it, it's, it, this is a curly question. It's a fraught question in many ways. Um, a good one <laughs> and we, we, we wrestle with it. 
um, a standard is a blunt instrument, I guess, at times. A methodology has to be spelt out, and that methodology is never going to be perfect in every situation. So, yeah, we've, we've had some situations where a couple of times uh, um, we've looked at it and said, well, that's profoundly, as a bell rating, profoundly <laughs> inadequate. And, uh, and other times, um, well, by way of example, uh, a house at Greenwich in Sydney, so this is on Sydney Harbour, um, in the middle of, you know, the, the lower north shore, leafy sort of, but, but highly urbanised, and, uh, and it's flame zone. <laughs> and it's 50 metres from the water's edge in Sydney Harbour on, on the, you know, so you kind of go, oh, that doesn't make a lot of sense either. But it's just because the, the methodology is what it is. And, and you know, sometimes it makes, um, more, well, usually it makes sense, sometimes it doesn't. And um, Yeah, I, I'm, I'm finding that too. I've, I've encountered a few waterfront properties uh, and even sort of uh, properties that are on beach frontages, uh, but that, that can almost get flame zone just from the dune vegetation. So uh, sometimes it's surprising, um, mm. but I, I guess we, yeah, we're not the experts that sort of make up the categories. Yeah, I mean, look, I, we, we've had a couple where we, we had flame zone and, and clearly it wasn't. And, uh, and so we said to our consultant, look, do you mind if we get a second opinion? So we, you know, we'd go further up the, uh, the bee pad tree and, get someone even more senior to come and they'd go, oh, well, methodology, I agree with you. It doesn't make sense, but the methodology is. Mm. And, uh, and so then we, in, in one instance, we call RFS and said, look, this is wrong. Um, you know, can you send someone out to site and have a look? And he came out and he, literally, I quote, he said, oh, yeah, yeah. Nah, sorry. Lovely day out, though. Sorry, flame zone. See you later. <laughs> Thanks. Um, it's coming close to, to uh, half past. It's 27 minutes after, and I'm, I'm told that we can go a few minutes longer to um, answer the, the questions that ha we're in now. I think it would be, we'd have to, no more questions, but um, are you willing to stay for another 10 minutes? Sure. Say? Yep. yep. Okay, let's try and go through the rest of these, these questions. Um, does anyone have comments about fire considerations that would apply to rammed earth? Um, I think this, the same thing applies as to um, any solid masonry construction, uh, mud, brick, ground earth, uh, PZ and reinforced concrete for that matter, in that it, no system that I'm aware of has been tested as a product, but it self-evidently is going to be fine. And it's really a case of um, pulling together what data you can and, and satisfying the certifier that way. Now, there may be other architects, builders, designers out there who've done more rammed earth and, and can, if they're listening, can chime in with an answer, but that's that's the best of my knowledge. Okay. Uh, I I, I'd add to that that the difficulty with a lot of unconventional um, building materials is then interfacing back into the conventional and making sure that you don't have the gaps. Um, and it's just how you, you get that seal between the two systems as a seal um, to make the fire, make the fire proofing. I'm going to, before we go on, I'm going to just, um, for those who want to leave now, it's uh, 28 minutes after, I just want to let you know about a couple of things before you, you head off. Um, first is um, we, in July, um, Yes, in July, there are going to be um, speed dating uh, with a sustainability expert um, sessions, which will be advertised uh, closer to the date, where it gives you an opportunity to, um, to meet with experts, um, designers, architects, and so on. And uh, pr priority will be given to people who are rebuilding. And uh, secondly, um, this is the final session for this week. Our session on, on Tuesday is on home energy setups for bushfire zones and climate resilience. Wednesday is water storage and fire resistant landscaping. And the final session on Thursday is retrofitting for fire resistance. So I just thought I'd, I'd um, say that so that uh, those who must leave at 7.30 can, um, um, can leave. 
Um, and then now it's back to our questions. I'm sorry, Rick, if I uh, if I talk, <laughs> called you short. <laughs> um, no problem. Okay. Um, no, another question, uh, are mineral wool bats for 450 millimeter stud walls readily available? My understanding is mineral or rock bats are more fire and moisture resistance, resistant than glass wool and more expensive, but I haven't found many options in Australia. Any of you? I haven't had too much experience with mineral wool, wool bats, but uh, yeah, I have found that the uh, there are a few fire resistant uh, insulation bats available, including the, the hardy fire one that, uh, that that was part of the system that I used. Uh, the, unfortunately, sometimes for the extra fire resistance, you drop in R value. So right. you right. quite often have to use uh, more of it. Yeah. I, I'm unaware that 450s were a problem. Um, I noticed that Rick was using earth wool, which is a mineral fibre. I thought they were available in 450s, but I, I um, yes, he's Rick's nodding furiously. <laughs> they are available. All right, another one. We are planning a two story build compact. Are there any special considerations for fire protection with a two story building? Hmm. Quite a good question. Uh, I don't, I, I don't, yeah, I don't, I don't think there'd be, uh, I can't say any differences between single story or two story. Yeah. Mm. No. Okay. Uh, no, might even be better. Yeah, yeah and, and it's going to be because it's compact, it, you, you're going to have more money up your sleeve to put in some good system. Yeah, I mean, when you think about the, the roof and, and floor are quite expensive in flame zone. So, um, mm. uh, so if you're building less, less floor and less roof, yeah. yeah. The, the CSIRO work shows that the more complex the roof line, the more the higher chance of, a, of the building burning. Yeah. Um, our design originally had dormers on it. Um, we had a big rethink and ended up turning the entire south wall into one big dormer to and took them out of the north wall, north roof entirely, just to simplify that roof line. Yeah, and I'd agree with that. Simplicity is is key um, to the point where you might end up with a box, and then you'll definitely cop a lot of criticism for that. But uh, uh, you know, it's uh, sometimes you've just got to uh, take the simplest approach. Yeah. But yeah, all, all those changes in direction of any materials and walls and roofs um, just add add risk of of uh, um, either either embers collecting and getting in or, 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 or leaves and things building up there that cause problems. Mm. There is a comment there about access for cleaning gutters. Um, and our plan is to fit gutter guards to the high gutters. Right. Yeah, actually yeah. just on that, it's interesting. Uh, um, we fitted gutter guards obviously onto to the one at Rosedale, but they, they fill up with leaves in a week. Um, and get clogged up. Um, our, our ideal solution would be to have no gutters, um, but you have to collect water um, according to the basics in New South Wales. So there's a few things that, yeah, if if uh, if we had our way, we might change like that. Because uh, definitely, if you're in a really high fire prone area, having no gutters is going to help. Mm. All right, thank you. Uh, Nigel, again, CSIRO and uh, state fire agencies are keeping such information too private. What worked re AS 3959, et cetera? Is that to you, Dick? Uh, yeah, no, it's, it's, uh, it's an, an issue we've been prodding them on. So, yep, okay. keep prodding. <laughs> um, would the HRV filter out the VOCs that Rick was so concerned to minimize? Oh, okay, no, VOCs generally, the ones you worry about are the ones generated inside the building mm. um, from things like um, the, you know, cheap vinyl flooring or um, particle board that's not designed to be E0 rated, etc. cetera. Um, the HRV is, is filtering external particulates and so on and VOCs can't, they're, they're um, vapors they can't be filtered out in that way right 
Um, I, any of you know about fire-friendly insurers? I can tell you that our insurance policy went up by 30% the following year, even though our assets have diminished down to bugger all. <laughs> right. I, th I think one of the things that I've, I've learned from uh, listening to community members here and checking my own insurance is read the fine detail, read the fine detail, read the fine detail. Um, there were people that thought they were well insured. Um, I think a lot, one of the things that happened was um, a, a lot of the, the policies didn't insure unless there was active flame Side was started by your house. So if your house melted um, because there was flame next door to it, but it didn't have actual open flame, then you weren't insured, which is kind of shocking as far as I'm concerned. And there were, there were, so going around town, there were some that would be considered a lot more um, agreeable to what some, some had to count the number of tea towels they had. And, you know, as far as, how did you read, how did they respond after the fires? So read this, read the fine print, I think. I'd also add, um, and again, the people who've gone through the black summer, hopefully have resolved their insurance issues by now, but insurance claims are just such an awful, awful process. Mm. Um, and you can spend, and we spent months before we even knew what our budget was going to be for the rebuild. Right. Right. Yeah. So look around and I mean, be, yes, it's a, I don't have an answer. <laughs> um, let's go to another question. Margaret says, no mention yet of protecting mm. solar panels and batteries. Yeah, good question. Yeah. Uh, since lithium batteries can explode in extreme heat, where and how can one safely store them? Um, mm. My perhaps somewhat controversial response to that would be that the, the relatively new Australian standard on um, household batteries is misguided in that it says that uh, lithium batteries, for example, uh, can not be inside the building. They have to be externally, um, you know, installed externally. And in a bushfire situation, if you want to re reduce that risk, that basically means you've got to build another enclosure around the, the, the batteries, which has to be both vented and fireproof. And therefore there's a whole lot of detailing and aesthetics and um, placement issues and, and, uh, and, and cost. Um, we are the only country I'm aware of, certainly in the OECD that has a standard like that. Uh, in Europe, it's perfectly fine to have your lithium batteries inside. So to me, it makes no sense. I'd like to think that at some point that standard is revisited. I suspect there was political interference from those who were resistant to renewable energy generally and, and, uh, and, and battery storage in particular. Um, I don't know that for sure, but I'm, I'll throw it out there as a hand grenade and see who, who jumps up and down. <laughs> our, our solution was to put a separate enclosure in on a nearby shed so the batteries are away from the house and we opted for the lithium tantalite oxide batteries, which are the safest of the, the lithium technologies. Um, I think I'll make this the last question on oh, just which one to choose. I think there are a couple about straw bales. Um, how, uh, how do they stand up to bushfires and then uh, fire? No, oh, this was an answer. Uh, Osbale has had fire testing done on straw bale and the reports are available from them. Okay, so they're good for at least Bell, Bell 40, maybe higher. So. Uh, we, we've, we've got uh, straw bale going into flame zone. Um, right. I must admit, we didn't use Osbale's fire testing. I didn't know it had been done. So thank you for that information. Um, yeah. And uh, we had to jump through the hoops kind of from first principles to prove it to the certifier's satisfaction. Mm. It can be done, yeah. Yeah. That's good. Um, okay, and one other. Um, hi, what would be considered a minimum roof pitch for a single skillion roof, please, considering ease of access, solar panels, ember attack, etc. Minimum roof pitch. What do you reckon, Tom? Well, 
the uh, the deem to satisfy uh, uh, roof design in, in the uh, in the standard only is only tested on custom org, um, so that's, that that's five degrees. Um, there's big condensation issues coming up with five degree roof pitches, though. So, you know, uh, what you were talking about before comes into that. So, uh, I, I agree that there's a bit more thought to go into roofs um, uh, because um, there, there, there's conflicting agendas between between fire and uh, and condensation. Yes. Yeah, so. Right. All right. No, I but think not not less than five. <laughs> not less than five. Not less than five. Okay, that's that's your answer, Andrew. <laughs> well, and, unless you're using a, um, a fire-resistant SIP, such as that FireTech with the PIR foam core, because mm. that solves the condensation issues, and you can. But but then um, you've still got minimum pitch. That particular product still got five degree pitch. Yep. Um, Bondor make another one with uh, um, a, a a different top profile that can go down to two degrees. Um, so it's possible, but um, yeah, there are a number of things to work through. It's not a simple, simple mm. kind of one, one answer fits all. Mm. Right. Well, I think I'm going to call it there. Thank you for the extra 10 minutes and for over 150 people staying on. Thank you all the participants and in particular, uh, the presenters, Rick, Tom and Dick. Thank you very much. And I hope to see everyone back next Tuesday for the fourth session in this uh, in this program. Um, good good night from us here at Renew.